You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 154, In This Moment. Hosted by Dan Terry. All right, bitch. Jeff Kane. Jing Hoagland eating my ass. And Joseph Wren. I said 50 more wings. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you let the games begin after inserting two quarters into your favorite pinball machine, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Jeff. What's happening, fellas? Can I use my mulligan on this one? How many mulligans do you get a year? Uh, enough to avoid this one? I think we agreed that I wasn't going to use the mulligans ever, so... 2020 is the year of no filler. To quote Discuss Metal Dan, we asked our listeners to suggest the bands they wanted to hear us talk about. To quote that feedback, in this moment, they are one of the best early metalcore bands, and in my opinion, the best female-led metalcore band out there. I need to take a drink of coffee before I say this. I'm going to wholeheartedly disagree with you. I definitely appreciate you filling out the form and suggesting the band for us to listen to. I'm going to disagree, though. I don't think that in this moment is a great early metalcore band and i'm only going to say that because they've been active since 2005 a good example of a early metalcore band would be something along the lines of like dead guy or converge or shy halud a band mixing hardcore aesthetics with metal riffing Is this a roundabout way of saying you just really don't like this band? In this moment is more of one of those bands that started off with the metalcore sound, but this was the more post-2000 mainstream metalcore sound. And I'm not saying that to be mean or, or disrespectful or anything like that. I just... That's just my that's just my feelings about the matter. Um, I don't want to give too much away about how I feel about this band, but I will just I'll have to disagree with you. But I do appreciate you giving us the suggestion anyway. Well, before Dan tells you how he really feels about this band, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify. Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion Podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. We love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion, whether they be domestic or international. And I have an international one to read for you guys right now. Over on Apple Podcasts, we got a review from Metalhead of Death from the United Kingdom. He says, very informative and highly entertaining. This show is absolutely fantastic, very well produced, highly informative and open-minded, but not afraid to be honest about things. The chemistry between the hosts truly fits the sitting down for a conversation with your friends type of mold. And I've often find myself sad whenever the weekly episode ends due to how much I've enjoyed it. Also, I'm a part of the Discord server that's mentioned during the episodes, and it's full of genuine and friendly folks who make you feel instantly welcome. Incredible listening. Keep up the excellent work. Thank you very much. I want to apologize that it takes a little bit longer for us to read the international reviews. They don't pop up as quickly as the American ones, unfortunately. We get to all of it, eventually. Once we get the information, we let you know all about it. That definitely needs to be, like the motto of the show we will get to everything (laughs) eventually you want to shout out our loyal patrons i would like to shout out to the world our loyal loyal patrons and that includes the likes of alex sander brian dean david brown jeffrey de los santos the actual mac josh moser Kiki Kuti, do you love me? I do love you. Lance Allagood, the king of metal. Native Keebs, Patrick Aspland, and Samuel Woodward. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for contributing to our Patreon and helping this show happen every week. I'd also like to say thank you to all of our patrons. One dollar gets you into that exclusive album review feed along with movie mosh commentary tracks that's right the entire film as we watch it everything that we think when we think it synchronized to the soundtrack of the film you love it you need it 
don't need this band. Oh, no. Oh. So, Dan. No spoilers, Jeff. <laughs> tell me about In This Moment. In This Moment is an American, quote, heavy metal, quote, band from Los Angeles, California. They were formed by their singer, Maria Brink, and their guitarist, Chris Holworth, in 2005. That's kind of what I'm getting at about the metalcore thing. Metalcore was very much alive and well in 2005. They released an album called Beautiful Tragedy in 2007, which was kind of their introduction to the world, and uh, let everybody know what In This Moment was all about, at least for that five minutes. I like this band as a set piece. I don't think they are better than most of the modern metal bands that most listeners enjoy today. But what they are now is the stage show. On one hand, it sounds like a lazy performance. You put the lead singer literally in a five-foot cage that she can't move around the stage in, have stage dancers that do all the moving and the shaking while the band just sits in the back and plays metal. We talked about it on the Ginger episode where she's got the costumes and the changing and moving around, being interactive with the audience, but the band just looks like they're there to be there. This is kind of that, but somewhere along the way, we dove into the electronic side of our music, and what they create now is just a repetitive modern metal mixed with electronics that almost every other metal band has tried at some point, so I don't know that it's special. I like it, but I really only like pieces of it. I do get annoyed eventually. All right, let's be frank. She has a a good voice when it comes to her clean vocals. Her screams, not so hot. So, I mean, I want to make that very clear. Whenever your harsh vocals aren't so hot, I'm not a big fan. So I'm probably going to be a little meaner than what I normally am when it comes to these episodes. She sounds more like a scream queen from a horror flick than she does a metal vocalist. Um, like the, the woman who leads Ginger. I mean, she is a fucking beast in my opinion. I'm disappointed in that part, uh, but what really drives me nuts and what seems to push them over the top is that this is more about uh, the looks than it is the substance of the band themselves. And uh, I'm not a big fan of that. I don't really give two shits what you look like. You're metal, you're fucking metal. And I don't think this band is metal at all. I think they're posers. I think they are a pop band in disguise. And they are formulaic. They're boring as shit. And it's one of the worst bands that I've ever been forced to listen to in my life. Let me give you some counterpoint, Jeff, because I want to get it out of the way early. Anybody can like metal, even if you're not necessarily matching the stereotype of this is what I listen to all the time. This is what I dress like. Would you agree? Anybody can go to the show. Sure. Somebody looked at Alice Cooper along the way and said, I could do that. It's basically like vaudeville. I can do that with my music. Alice Cooper consistently compared to Marilyn Manson and vice versa. I don't know what I would compare in this moment to because this is 2020. If anything, I want to compare it most to Lady Gaga because she doesn't have the performance. She's literally standing in a cage singing metal, but that's their set piece. That's what they want to do. Now, is it more interesting than other bands I've heard or listened to? No, I'll be honest with you. Once we covered Ginger, I basically said that's better than what In This Moment has been trying to do the whole time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, when you compared it to Lady Gaga, I would, I'm going to say I'm going to prepare them, prepare, compare her more to like a Christina Aguilera or Britney Spears held Justin Timberlake. This is all about the look and zero substance. I mean, they are a female-led demon hunter. I mean, we it's generic, it's boring, it's safe, it's basic, and it's radio-friendly, and it's obviously that I'm making it very clear that's just not my cup of tea. Great I mean, final thought. What's your uh, album of the week, Jeff? <laughs> yep, we can end the episode here now because it's probably going to be me shitting on them almost the whole time. There's a couple of things about them that I do like. There's a couple of tracks that I actually really do enjoy and which probably pisses me off more than anything else. It shows the fucking chops are there, but it's not taken advantage of. And that really 
pisses me off big time. Well, there's pieces of everything in the last 15, 20 years in this band. They've got the Guano Apes vocals on some of the early records. They've got yeah. the riffs of the modern metal and even Degent. They throw in some fucking dubstep because why not? It's fucking shitty and it's modern. People liked it for a minute. Then they do the Otep thing. Then they do the Asking Alexandria bullshit. We're going to throw in some Alice Cooper and some visuals. I think the irony is what they're trying to present is the idea of the fallen pop star, but that's been done so many times along the way. Think about their song Sex Metal Barbie. She's talking about how, yeah, I'm just this pretty thing that you stare at. Yeah. But you're standing in a cage. Literally, I have no choice but well, to yeah, look at you. She's trapped in it. <laughs> Let's just Despite get Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat trapped in a cage. Let's just get into the albums. Yeah, let's do it. Beautiful Tragedy, 2007. Sucked. Next. Do you guys like <laughs> Do you guys like metalcore? I enjoy some metalcore from time to time. So when you think of metalcore, what are some bands that you think of? Like just metalcore and what band pops into your head? First one is Hope's Fall, only because everybody ripped them off, not because they are metalcore. After that, you get some Shy Halud, unfortunately Glassjaw, because Dan Terry insists I listen to them. I don't think any of that's metalcore. For newer me metalcore, I'd say uh, Kill Switch Engage, Bullet for My Valentine. For as far as like processed, uh, classic Under Oath. There's two different types of metalcore, and we actually tackled that on uh, an episode way back when. And there is the badass in your face version of metalcore and then there is the uh clean singing you know version of it that we got with uh bands like kill switch engage and as i lay dying and stuff like that the gothenburg influenced and the hardcore influenced i'm gonna take my stab at it i'm gonna think as i lay dying kill switch engage unearth and this is just bands kind of from that era uh fit for a king I mean, there, there's a lot of metalcore bands that had... It was a lot of the Gothenburg riffing mixed in with the hardcore breakdowns of the late 90s. You know, very intense, growling, screaming, guttural vocal delivery from a lot of those bands. Beautiful Tragedy by In This Moment doesn't have any of that. You know what? Joe actually hit on something earlier that I think actually fits really well, and that's Guano Waves. This first record is, is Guano basically that. Yeah, this I want to be Sandra. No, no, this makes Guano Ape sound like fucking Slayer. But it's the, it's a similar style uh, to Guano Apes. It really is. It's melodic rock with female vocals over the top of it that go extreme sometimes. Right, and that's exactly what Guano Apes is. The only difference is Guano Apes, I think, did it better. And that's just my personal opinion. You know what I said? You know, this is shit next. I, I'm being harsh because actually this album is not, it's not too bad. It's more raw. It's more uh, emotion. It hasn't been overproduced yet. And it's, it's listenable. Uh, it's not overproduced. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, compared to their later shit? Uh, no, it's not nearly overproduced to some of their later stuff. This Dude, this is metalcore just fucking standardized like it is so fucking trite and basic in places that it makes demon hunter sound like fucking nile in comparison so you like i you mean i you think some of their future albums are less overproduced than this one i'm not making that argument what i'm saying is that this album is very overproduced Oh, I agree. I'm just saying, comparatively speaking to their other releases... Like, even when they play breakdowns and shit, I mean, it hits you like nothing. I'm you following know, what like, you're saying, Jeff. Like, you're talking about the programming they do later, where they throw right. in the over-zealous uh, bullshit. It's like that, that tough guy that walks up to you, and it's all talk about how tough and crazy he is, and then he punches you, and it doesn't even phase you at all. That's what the breakdowns are like on this record. The screaming annoys me more than the singing because she actually has a really good singing voice. But, like, they have, like, a little bit of the um, Gothenburg-style riffing, although it just sounds really just like bad Kill Switch Engage or bad Asley Dying. Like, it's 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 significantly slowed down, and it's just there. Like, and it, it I think that if the record had been produced better... It actually would have hit harder. Like, those metal moments would have hit harder 
but instead the guitars are more or less turned down. The crunches are turned down. It's like all buried in the mix and her vocals are on top of everything. Yeah, and I think that's by design. I mean, she is what the band is trying to sell. So I understand the, the reasoning behind going that route. Whether we agree with it or not, you know, that's a completely different discussion. Well, and her screaming voice doesn't have the kind of grit that I would associate with metalcore. No, it's very thin. It's not even as brutal as like a Chester Bennington. Like, it's really not... And like it just it's like it's like somebody just shot a spit wad at me. Who has the better scream instead in of a gunshot in this moment or flyleaf? Oh flyleaf oh. hands down. Yeah. Way better scream. I'm trying Agreed. to get a scale for your opinion at this time. I mean I, I would take flyleaf over this any any yeah. day of the week. Uh Lacey's badass. I think it's mixed as best as it could be for whatever budget they had. I remember listening to Sirius and it had to be the hard rock or metal station, whatever it was called back then. I do not remember. I haven't had satellite radio for a very long time. Octane. But they were talking about in this moment, and they'd play these songs. And it was one of those examples where you feel like as a consumer, you're having something shoved down your throat because the band wasn't there. And then all of a sudden, they're there, and they're the biggest deal, and you have to consume, consume, consume. Here's the single. Shove it down your throat. I'm not making a direct comparison to Ginger, but it sounds like I am. The point is, it doesn't live up to the hype that it was given. So what were they trying to sell us? They were trying to sell us the hype. They're trying to sell us the front woman. I don't see why. Well, Unless you're trying to create, like you said, the pop star as opposed to the metal singer. I think that's part of it. But, you know, the other thing that I, we should probably think about, and it's something that has been used against me quite a bit with my ghost arguments. And that was because uh, I have a really good friend who is like worships at the altar of ghost. He says, you have to see them live. If you see them live, you will change your mind. Because I was actually that way back in the day, and I've said it a million times, with Lenny Kravitz. I saw Lenny Kravitz, to this day, still the best performer I've ever seen on stage. It was stunning. I'm going to follow you on this because the record, in many cases, does not live up to the live show with young bands. I will follow you on that one. So it could be that they're just, you know, you got to see them live to, to change your impression of, uh, of who they are. And I think that they definitely use the fact that she is she is a stunningly beautiful woman. I mean, there's you can't argue that fact. I mean, she is gorgeous. I'm listening. I'm not watching. Uh, you know, if she was a TV star, uh, you know, that's something different. I don't care if she is the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth or she is the wicked witch of the West. I really don't care. I just want somebody to give me good music, and I'm not getting that. And the frustrating thing is, is that buried underneath all of that, like Dan said, she has some pipes. I mean, she can genuinely sing. She has quite the powerful chest voice, and I think it's fantastic when she's actually given the opportunity to use it. And the, frust the other frustrating thing is, as we'll get to it later, uh, uh, is... When it's time for her to, you know, go a little bit lighter on her vocals, then, you know, it's overdubbed and it's layered with a bunch of other vocals and it sounds like shit then. But we'll get to that when we get to it. I apologize for how mean or gatekeepy this is going to sound because people are like, yeah, they do something a little bit poppy. They're super successful. Why are you mad? Are you jealous? I'm not jealous or mad. I'm. A, it's just the fact that you called it metal, that you called it metalcore. Because it's just something that frustrates me a lot is hearing people that don't really understand what they're describing and describing it as something else. And you can argue with me all you want about how it doesn't matter what the genre is. It doesn't matter what the tags are. I guarantee you that in any other aspect of your life, if Jeff walks up to me and he's eating an apple and he's like, God damn, this is the greatest fucking grape I've ever had in my life. You should try it too. It's a really good grape. It's the best example of a grape. It's going to fucking piss you off. You're going to want to correct him because he is wrong. And then somebody's going to throw out a, you know, oh, well, if you take taking a six and a nine and you see it written down, 
you know, people are going to walk up to it from two different directions. And it's for one person, it's a six, and another person, it's a nine. 69. Nice. Here's the thing, though. Somebody originally sat down and drew a six or a nine. And whichever one they decided to draw is the correct answer. I don't care what the other perspective is. If you, you if you want to go against documentable fact, this is not metalcore. This is metalcore for people that think they like metalcore. But yep. as soon as as soon as you turn on something like Dead Guy or Converge, they're like, "Oh, what is this?" Yeah, I would say uh, another good example of of uh, trying to put a uh, square peg in a round hole, uh, where they trying to say that this is you know metalcore would be like saying Avril Lavigne is pop is punk you know but she's really pop because I remember back then you know she was supposed to be the edgy uh, punk star and obviously we, we know now that's definitely not the case and perspective is important because the people that complained about Avril Lavigne not being punk were the same people that are all like oh my god I love good Charlotte did you guys hear that Green Day stuff like those people didn't know what the fuck they were talking about either there's people that are listening to this podcast right now being like, Dan doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about either. This is not Metalcore. The local band that came out in the 90s in my local scene is the actual inventor of Metalcore. And you know what? They're probably right. But from my perspective, it is very irritating for people to throw out like, oh yeah, this is Metalcore, this is Metalcore, just because it's got a couple of weak breakdowns and some fucked up, ripped off Gothenburg riffs. And some pretty kick-ass solos that won't really return. Not really. And uh, the guitar work's actually not terrible on this record. I do feel like if the guitars had been turned up a little bit, it would be a little bit more brutal. But this is absolutely no more brutal than a five finger death punch or, uh, you know, <laughs> or even, even like a Papa Roach. Like, I don't think it's really that extreme or that shocking. And maybe the screaming might make you think so. But, like, trust me, there's a lot better screaming out there. As far as her singing goes, she is a fantastic vocalist. And I would actually like to hear her in more of a pop, like a more honest, like pop representation of what she's throwing down. And, you know, I'd have to mention lyrics here a little bit. Her lyrics are actually very heartfelt and very personal. And I think that is the main crux of what draws people to this band is that she does have very relatable personal lyrics and she sings them very well. And uh, that's going to become very apparent on their next album. 2008. The dream. It's time to go down the rabbit hole. You can take us there, Joe. I don't really want to. <laughs> well, we don't either. I've been there. I survived, and I found the way out. I wasn't dumb enough to go down the hole to begin with. Said Tweedledum to Tweedledee. <laughs> <laughs> My perception of in this moment started with 2012's blood, which we will get to. I feel like I had to work to go back and listen to these older albums and not know where it was going to go. At a glance, I like The Dream. I like Beautiful Tragedy more because it's a rock record that's borderlining on metal. The Dream continues the same feel. Production's a little better. It's only a year later. I feel like the band was trying to do straight metal with melody thrown in on top. And it's really hard to not think that somebody else got a hold of the band and said, we need to make your lead singer the thing that everybody focuses on. Because what we're going to get later, not this nice sounding. And I could take this serious as it is. But something really bothers me knowing that in a few years, we're going to get the 2012 version of Betty Boop singing death metal. I don't hear any metal on this at all. This is a straight ahead rock and roll album. Yep. This sounds like uh what Fallout Boy? A little bit. I can't bag on this record too much. This is what this band should sound like. Yeah. When it's the the pop rock, you know, I think it's primo. And I think that that's what they should stick with. It's not trying to be something that it's not on this record. And, and it, I I got to appreciate good. that. I mean, her clean singing is I think that should be their... I've always thought that should be their bread and butter. Her clean singing, especially early on, is just... It, it, it's what I would like to listen to whenever I'm hearing a, you know, a rock song on the radio. I think they would, uh, they would own the airwaves if that's what they would have done the entire time. 
and I would be perfectly fine with it and happy with it because it sounds good. Is it formulaic and generic? Yeah, but when they're doing it like this... That's more acceptable in this genre. Right. If When they're doing it like this, she can do it better than most other people. So I'm perfectly fine with it because this part of it sounds really good and I like it. Uh, I wish they did more of it and that's probably one of my biggest gripes. She should be like the ballad queen in my opinion. I think she could just... You know, when we used to have the 80s hair bands would come out with those... You know, more than words by Extreme off of Porno Graffiti 2. Before that came out, I mean, Extreme was, for the time, a somewhat extreme band. But my God, did they nail the ballads. I could totally see her in that light and would love every second of it. I totally agree. Like, I think this makes the most sense for the band. And uh, it's not really my cup of tea, but I can't criticize it for being formulaic because that's what this genre is. And I'm, o- I'm okay with it in that regard. And I think, yeah, they accentuated what their best stuff was. Obviously, the metal stuff that they were trying to do on the last album wasn't working. So they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll make it more melodic. We'll make it more of an appeal to the masses instead of trying to target metal heads, which would just be really fucking stupid to do with this band. And so, yeah, they went the mainstream route, and it makes the most sense. And so I can't really criticize this record because I think it's the best that they sounded. Because it's emotional, it's honest, it's heartfelt, and it just is what it is. It stays in its lane, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 2010, a star-crossed wasteland. Oh boy, okay. I'm not going to lie to you guys, I'm having a hard time because I know where this thing ends. Yeah. I want to know what changed. I want to know what conversation happened. I have limited knowledge of the backstory she has shared publicly. I wonder, did we just have a mild breakdown of I'm not going to pretend to even remotely be a positive person and sing these positive songs? I want this music to be dirgy and create a fucking pissed off feeling in the audience that we have previously not created. Did we change our vocal style or just stop maintaining what we had? Did the band say we want to tune down and do the modern metal thing seven years before that happened? I don't know how this happened. I don't know how we got here. But I think we woke up pissed off one day, and this is the direction we went. No, I think we saw a shtick that we thought that would work, and we went for it. Are you saying that a star-crossed wasteland is this band's Smells Like a Freak Show? Yeah, I think so. This is their uh, Smells Like a Freak Show uh, Jeff, avatar Jeff, I got moment. it. Okay, this is what we're going to do. So we've been doing the whole Beauty Queen thing. We're going to take that a step further. I'm going to be the fucking metal Barbie doll. Yeah, and it, you all are going to put me in a cage and make me fucking sing. I'm going to be the songbird of heavy metal. Yeah, so she's gone from Carrie winning Homecoming Queen, and now the pig's blood's been dumped on her. <laughs> That's and really she, good, actually. I'm going to go with that one. <laughs> and... We well, haven't gotten to the blood yet. Well, this album's not called Blood. That's the next album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of the idea is that, okay, yeah, this works. There's a bunch of horny metalhead boys out there that uh, would love to see me in these teeny tiny corsets dancing in a little cage. You boys want to see a real woman? I, I mean, she's... To be fair, she might be unique in that way. Yeah, she's absolutely <laughs> stunning. And you know what? At the end of the day, sex sells. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. And she is beautiful, and she uses that to her advantage, I would think. And I think that uh, she is definitely a uh, wolf in sheep's clothing because she's not a, I don't think she's a, a metal front woman. I think that this record is definitely heavier than the last album and the one before it, Beautiful Tragedy. I think a lot of people thought, oh, this is a return to the Beautiful Tragedy sound. It's not. It's actually heavier. A lot of the stuff that I complained about about that first album is kind of fixed here. The guitars are louder. The crunches are crunchier. The breakdowns are heavier. This is actually a little bit more of a straight-ahead metal approach than just trying to sound metalcore because it doesn't have all that dumb bullshit that you get from the mainstream metalcore stuff. That wasn't this. It sounds like somebody heard a Pantera record and was like... groovy. 
No, it's not. But it's 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 as it's as groovy. It is to Pantera what the first album was to metalcore in general. Okay, you get what I'm saying there? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I think that I find this record kind of enjoyable. I'm still not the biggest fan of her screaming vocals, but I mean, all she kind of does on this record is scream, and um, I don't think it has as much to do with sex appeal as you guys are saying it does. M- maybe it does. I'm just kind of like from the live shows, it does. I don't really think about that kind of stuff w- when approaching this this topic. I just want to look at the records and what they are. I'm just and trying to figure out why it's so popular. That's oh, it's so popular on the strength of the previous album and on the strength of the one before. Because, like I said about people that hated Avril Lavigne but loved Good Charlotte, you know, th- there's a bunch of idiots that thought that the first record was fucking primo, supremo, motherfucking heavy metal, right? And so they're pissed off when the next record comes out and doesn't have any screaming on it because people are actually that fucking stupid, including me sometimes. And so they put this out and everybody gets to say that this is an attempt to please both fan bases where you're going to get a little bit of that ballady shit that we had on the last album, but you're going to get all the screaming and heavy guitars from the first album. And so it's not as much of a creative difference as as people might be acting like it is. It's really, we just took those two sounds and mashed them together. We turned the guitars up a little bit because that was a complaint that some asshole on a podcast had about it. And uh, we're going to just go in a heavier direction and we're going to retain all of those people. So again, you're, you're, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree though whenever you're trying to please metalheads who are used to listening to music that is far heavier, far more technical, and far more proficiently played than it is here. Do you think the majority of female screamers are not presented as strongly as some of the male screamers? What do you mean by presented? When you listen to the record, the voice is in a different place in the mix. It's higher in nature as opposed to the guttural chest scream that you are a fan of personally, but dynamically in the mix hits you a different way. The only way I can explain it that makes sense to me is sometimes you feel like your head is being squeezed, sometimes you feel like your whole body is being crushed, and depending on how it's presented, it feels differently. So you might listen to a star-crossed wasteland and ask yourself, Why do I not feel this as much as I would, say, an Under Oath record? It's arguably mixed the same way. She has the high scream, the shredding female. The only way I could think of is Butcher Babies. That type of scream that everybody does, but we don't have the guttural that we normally have with this type of metal or even metalcore. Well... It's because she's not good at the screams. I mean, if you want to talk about a female that does uh, fantastic gutturals, I mean, you only need one song to to have that point proven, and that's Pisces by Ginger. I mean, that's how you fucking do it, okay? That that's that's what it should sound like, and that's what we love. I mean, she gets my respect because she kicks ass and takes names. And I don't get that on any of the uh, in this moment stuff. It's just it's thin. Like I said, it it makes me think of uh, Screen Queen stuff. That's why I keep on using all these references because that's what I think of when I hear her scream is more of an ethereal, high pitched howl that I would get. That's a blood curdling scream, not the badass metal growl that we expect you know and maybe that's me being a meathead expecting it to sound a certain way that's not something she does you know that's probably my fault that's not her fault that i'm expecting it to to be a particular way but it's also because it's being marketed in a certain manner and i'm like no you know these two things are not the same here and i think maybe if it had been marketed differently as and as not metalcore i'd be probably a more appreciative of it as well because i'm like no this is not what that is i don't think it's a gender thing no it's not i think it because i mean like Alyssa and angela from arch enemy yeah are badass are are incredible and i don't think that the mixing is different because it's a female i think i think the higher pitched shrieks in metal be it male or female the higher pitched shrieks for whatever reason don't hit as hard as the deeper gutturals do which is why a band like showbread or a band like blood brothers uh would not be considered metal just because they have screaming vocals where some bands might not be metal at all but get labeled as such because they've got more guttural screaming vocals so i don't i don't think that's the problem i think that's the question i'm trying to ask 
it's sonically different from what the majority of the population is used to. And it's in its own box because it doesn't have a choice. That's just the sound that she makes. That's the sound that the band makes. But it's never going to hit as hard as some of those bands. No, and I don't think it needs to. I just don't think that her screaming vocals are as amazing as they are advertised to be. I guess is, is, is kind of my final word on it. That, like, they're not, she's just not a great screamer, and that's fine, I guess. But, you know, it would be helpful if they had somebody in there that was actually screaming really well. And, uh, but that, that goes against the image of the band that we've got a singer that's the total package vocally can sing and scream really, really well. But I think it just falls flat on its face when one is, is infinitely better than the other. And the fact that the part that's getting, that's infinitely better is uh, woefully neglected on a regular basis. That's the other frustrating thing. 2012, Blood. You can imagine my surprise, having heard this first and going backwards. If I was on board the whole time, my first question would be, what the fuck, guys? (laughs) It doesn't just sound like they changed styles. It sounds like they threw everything in a blender and came out remixed by seven different DJs. And no, I'm not just talking about Blood, which is supposed to be a fucking dubstep song. The whole record is just cranked to the max to try and punch harder than it actually does. But I think this is the first time we get the modern in this moment. Everything you had before this was not the same band. Yeah, this sounds like, um, makes me think of Korn, the one album that shall not be named. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I feel on, on this one a little bit, this particular song, uh, Blood. But I will say this, in defense of this album, easily, and I mean 100%, easily my favorite song of theirs and a song that I would listen to over and over again, which I actually have, is on this, and that's track 14, uh, the song 1111, is, it's beautiful, okay? And it shows you what she could do uh, if given the opportunity. And I think it's what she should be doing instead of the high-pitched screams. I think it's beautiful, and I love it. It was the same thing with um, with the band Flaw. Uh, whenever they did the um, stripped down acoustic version of only the, only the strong and it's just him and the piano it's beautiful and amazing and i always wanted more of that from flaw and that's kind of how i feel on this i'm like this should be the bread and butter that's my personal opinion controversial statement this is the most original they've sounded yeah so I far in their career i mean this is different it's different enough what you have here is a band that has decided to abandon the metal core completely which i think is a great yes a, a really great decision it's more new metal than it is metalcore and i'm okay with that it fits <laughs> it fits vocally better and um you know i'm kind of okay with bad screaming in new metal like it's kind of loud for some reason and uh, cuz you know they're not metal people necessarily they're not they're not necessarily based in traditional metal so i give it kind of a kind of a free pass instead you get more of like a modern arena rock approach and what they do is to not make it sound like they went straight arena rock they added some electronic elements into the album to make it just a little bit to make it pop a little bit more and i mean that both ways i mean it pops like you can hear it better it's like more in your face but it also puts it in a more pop direction and maybe introduces them into a bigger audience overall because that's the whole plan with this band is how how many more people can we get this in front of i mean that should be the goal of any band but you know what i'm saying right this is one of those uh the visual over the uh, audio type of bands. Just loud anthemic choruses. Yeah, and you know what? It's like the Nickelback of metal. I mean, it fucking worked. No, it, no, Demon Hunter is the Nickelback <laughs> of metal. <laughs> These guys are right up there with Demon Hunter when it comes to that. I disagree. I think that... Because it's not as formulaic? I think that Blood On, it's not as formulaic as something like a Demon Hunter or a Modern In Flames. Okay, I, and I, I would absolutely give you that. I think I think that this band, believe it or not, gets better as they go in the sense that it's not really my cup of tea overall, but I find less shit to complain about because this isn't, the, they're no longer in the territory of trying to be something they're not. Like I know all the websites and streaming services all tag it as metalcore. It's really not that and it's no longer trying to be that. And so... Then I have to take off my my angry asshole metalcore fan goggles and say, yeah, this is catchy. 
It's not as formulaic as it once was. I don't find a lot of substance in the music overall, but I could see why people are into this and why this is catchier. I mean, this was their first certified gold selling album, and I, I understand why, because it's the very first time they're actually offering us something kind of new. Yeah, this is officially their sound now. It just took them a while to find it. Right, and I'm in that in that aspect, I'm happy, but as time goes on, they start to lose the one thing that I think works well for them, and that's her voice. It gets lost in the mix the further you, uh, in the neck. We'll get to it, especially in Ritual. Are we ready for Black Widow? I think we are. I think this record and Blood go together. Holy shit, is that 81 listens do I see on that? You Jim? absolutely do, because Big Bad Wolf is a badass song. Wow. We wrote it first. And my niece has access to my streaming collection. Oh, sure. <laughs> excuses, excuses. Sure. I think these two albums go together very well. They're a stage product, a performance, like you said. I actually think this is better Smells Like a Freak Show than that band. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not singing about fucking owls. Yeah. So I... You're right. It, this is where I said, you know, maybe the the live performance should we should be uh, factored in because the music itself starts to get a little more theatrical as well. Have you seen in this moment live? I have not. I mean, on YouTube I have, but I haven't like actually experienced them live in concert. I have not either. It would be really hard for somebody to convince me to go see them, though. It would have to be one of those things where I was at a music festival and they were one of the acts and there was nothing on the side stage that I wanted to see. And then I would probably watch it just because I know that there's a s spectacle aspect of their music and that could be interesting. You know, I, I just like any other person, I want to be entertained. Are you not entertained? That would probably be what they'd be asking. Because I'm not super entertained. I mean, like I said, no, this I mean really, at a live show. Yeah, this really isn't my thing. And my biggest issue with this record really isn't even an issue, but it just goes goes on a little long. It's 60 minutes. I'm kind of like trying to stay awake while listening to it because, like I said, there's not a whole lot of substance to the songs, you know? Like, there, there's, if I'm not watching it live, I'm, I'm missing out on whatever the, the punchline to the joke is, I guess. Because, like, I just, I can't listen to an album this long and stay into it because I just, it doesn't hold my attention very much. And I feel like that's one thing is that they didn't really change enough between this and blood for me to be like, well, why would I listen to this over blood? I mean, I understand if you're a hardcore fan, you will, but I'm, I'm clearly not that. I think these are two records that have one batch of songs split up strategically. That's all it is. So you're saying between the two, uh, you could make one kick-ass solid album? I think you could put them together and create one gigantic show. I think the band, when they decided they wanted to be a bigger deal than what they were, they're shooting for the two-hour set now, trying to become the band that headlines the show. And in order to do that, you have to deliver a large amount of product that the fans are going to come and sit and listen to. Two hours. God, I'd be dead of alcohol poisoning by then. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That means they did their job because they're probably getting a cut of that sales. They probably are. I'm paying like $9 a beer. And they got nine cents of that $9. <laughs> yeah, times 15 because, you know, I just walk up and I'm like, all right, here's my, here's my debit card. I'm just going to come up and ask for beers and you're going to give it to me as long as this thing doesn't decline. Don't run it to see if it's going to decline yet. <laughs> Wait, wait until the 15th. Uh, hold on. Okay, try this one. This is the Discuss Metal credit card. Uh, I'm, I'm doing research for my show, so if it gets declined, you know, it should be on the house anyway. You guys should be honored to have such a revered podcaster in your midst. Damn right. Every single time security just, like, they set me down outside gently because of how famous I am. <sighs> I think we're ready for ritual, guys. We are. 2017. So, Joe and I were talking about this a little earlier. You listen really, really closely. You can hear male vocals just droning on underneath her, really low in the mix. And don't dig that. The other thing, too, when she's trying to sing clean on this, they layer the fuck out of her. They uh, have all these vocal effects on all of her clean singing. It makes me wonder, did she blow out her voice and she can't hit that shit anymore? Like Steven Tyler kind of Aerosmith 
mess that, that he created, none of those powerful vocals are really apparent on Ritual. At least, I, not that I remember. Compared to the other records, it does sound like the producer is compensating for a problem he didn't really have. The Dream, Beautiful Tragedy, they weren't really thickened with the vocals. We talked about that. No problem. You put five or six layers on top of this, you have to do that just to compete with the electronics. But you start to hear kind of this undertone, and my favorite example is actually Blood, which may be on purpose because that's supposed to be over the top and ridiculous. But it sounds like they just layered every little frequency they could trying to make this giant movie soundtrack explosion. Like they were trying to create machines with the metal, but what they were really doing was programming machines with metal. And Ritual is trying to go back to the a star-crossed wasteland and the dream, trying to bring blood into the giant stadium. Because now they're just making a big deal out of it for the sake of making a big deal. They're making it big on purpose. They're not even trying to anymore. It's just, this is the product. It's got to be huge. I don't even know what to say at this point. I mean, I kind of like the atmosphere that this record puts forward. Like, it definitely has kind of a vibe. And it's kind of like this, like, darker... It's kind of like what Zeal of Art, Zeal and Ardor actually does really well, and this band doesn't. It's like a lot of stuff, like, they want us to clap along. It, again, like we've been saying this whole time, it's all for the live show. And uh, Metal Hammer even agrees with me whenever they said, like, this album is, like, a compliment to their theatrical shows. The exact, the direct quote is, feels like it's been created as a soundtrack to the In This Moment's eye-popping Lady Gaga meets Rob Zombie live shows rather than a standalone album. The funny thing is, Lady Gaga would be into that. You can't tell me she wouldn't. Well, the one thing I can tell you is it sounds like that she's singing through a fucking megaphone through this whole goddamn album. Yeah, it, it she's really doing does. the fake blues thing where you get the microphone and you just do do the Dan Terry is going to be the lead vocal. We're going to sing through the amp, guys. Oh, it's fucking driving me insane. It bothers me quite a bit because, like, you know, there's another band that has a vocal style similar to what she's trying to do here, and that would be Porta's Head on their self-titled album. Okay. That would be this done correctly. I, I just, it goes back and forth between it sounds like she's yelling into a microphone, or I'm sorry, into a megaphone, and then they go back into that overproduced pop sound for the choruses, and it's kind of jarring. Because it, it kind of, like, takes you out of it a little bit. I'm being really nitpicky here, but, like, I, I just don't find a lot of substance in this music. And, like, you know, do we did we really need another cover of In the Air tonight? Oh, it's terrible, too. I, After yeah. Nonpoint, you don't need another one. Yeah, and, like, Black Wedding, Rob Halford can't even save it. Yeah, and it's essentially, I mean... If Rob Halford can't save your song, then you're fucked. I was like, yeah, he can't save the song, and then it's essentially White Wedding with it's at night instead of the day and i'm like ooh, we're edgy but no i didn't just it sucks i mean it sucks that we can't get into it you know because there's a lot of people out that are enjoying it and we're just not those people so obviously this music is not made for us i have to say i am very happy about the song roots which is track 11 was roots, not bloody roots was not some kind of haphazard cover of roots bloody roots by sepultura because I know we've been angry on this podcast, but trust me, I would be fucking shouting all through this episode if that had existed towards the end of the discography and I had to wait that long to fucking talk shit about it. Overall, you can pretty much expect more of the same from this band in the future. They found this sound on blood and they're going to stick with it because if you have the potential to release an incomplete product that can only be completed by the band seeing the band live then I guess you did really well because you guys are making way more money than I'm making and uh, you guys are doing it right. So uh, hats off to you, I guess. Final thoughts on In This Moment. Jeff. Disappointment. I mean, I could almost put it in just a single word. Disappointment. There's so much possibilities for her vocally. I think she's amazing whenever she wants to be. But I sometimes think that maybe she's blown out her vocals now. Or she's got a producer that expects her to sound uh, a certain way to continue the fandom that she does have. Disappointment. That's about all I can say. Dan, what about you? I'm good. I, I expected this to sound a lot cooler than it did. Because I hadn't really listened to In This Moment too much before we did this episode. And I knew that they had, you know, they were a female-fronted band. 
uh, as, as it was sold to me, you know, screams, singing, a, a, a metalcore band with pop sensibilities doesn't necessarily sound too unattractive to me. I can definitely tell you if you're in this band, if you're looking at this band for the metalcore, there's a lot better metalcore bands out there that you should check out. And uh, if you listen to this show, I'll tell you all about them. <laughs> That's right. But as far as in this moment goes, if you're looking for a, a decent mainstream rock band, there's better mainstream rock bands out there too. But whenever they do stay in that lane, it's fine. I am not caffeinated, sedated, or stimulated enough to buy into in this moment as a whole. I like the band, but I like them when I want to listen to a variety of poppy metal bands or poppy metal songs. I think they've become a playlist band for me. They've got some good songs, but much like Tool, you can't sell me on the discography based on the fact that I need to go to the live show to truly appreciate what the band is trying to create. If the music is what it is, then is it as good as everything else? And no, I don't think it is. I think as a whole, there are things that you will enjoy, especially if you're a pop fan or a heavy music fan who has pop tendencies. It's there, you'll like it, but it's not anywhere close to as good as some of the solid metal bands that you could be listening to. Dan, what's your album of the week? My album of the week is Rivers of Night Hills, Where Owls Know My Name. Jeff, what about you? I am going off the radar, no metal for me this week. It is uh, Lifa by Heilung, and that's some badass shit, though. If you like uh, tribal uh, music from, like, northern Germany from back in the day, it's some pretty cool shit. Why don't you just fucking text that to me? <laughs> oh, dude, you guys gotta check it out. Lifa by Heilung. Oh, my gosh. It is... Amazing. And yes, I will text it to you. I can't save you from a mediocre band if that's what you're listening to and you're upset. But I can strongly suggest that you dig out your copy of Firepower by Judas Priest and give nice. it another listen. Take us out, DFT. Have you ever been listening to this podcast and thought to yourself, I want to hear these guys shit all over a band I just suggested? <laughs> well, you know what? We can do that for you. Maybe. We might like it. We might not like it. Don't let the fact that we didn't like a band discourage you from continuing to give us band suggestions to cover on the show. It's always entertaining whether we like it or not, in my opinion. There's a few ways you can reach out to us. One of the ways is on Facebook.com slash Discography Discussion. You can send us a DM. You can join our Discography Discussion official group on Facebook. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You could even join our Discord server. There's a link in the show notes that'll take you right to our Discord server where you can chat with us and fans of the show pretty much anytime you want, 24-7. As long as we're awake, we'll probably join in on the discussion. If you don't feel like doing any of that, you can always click on our fillable form that will be in the show notes that is specifically made for your band suggestions. So keep them coming. And on that note, this has been Episode 154 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to DanAndJoeShow at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Give me your money so I can get a new shtick. Right.